Hi Knitters, it's Christina here again. Welcome back to A Knitter's Life. It is um, the 22nd of August. So we have finally reached the, oh, I guess we're not in the, even in the middle of August anymore. We're kind of towards the end, but um, we've started school. John has had his first few days of school, and they've gone really well. He was really excited to um, start school. He started kindergarten, so um, it's a new season of life, I guess. Um, words can't really describe what um, what it is. So anyways, we'll move on. <laughs> I'm sure those of you moms who have um, who have a kindergarten, kindergartner who just went off to kindergarten and who has been home with you for the majority of the time can understand um, what it's like here at home now. And, and John is my talkative one, so it is very quiet. <laughs> but anyways, how are you guys? How, is, how did your summer end? At least I feel like my summer has ended now that school has begun. Um, I know it's still hot out, and boy, here in Indiana, it is very hot. Um, we ha enjoyed a very cool, unseasonably cool July, and now it's really, really humid and um, in the high 80s, uh, low 90s. So with the he heat index, it's, it's basically um, in the low 90s every day. So it's kind of too hot. The boys don't want to play outside anymore, which is kind of sad, but um, it will cool down again. Autumn's coming, right? And we'll be outside again playing. But um, anyways, what have we been up to? Well, before school started, we took a jaunt to the Indiana State Fair. And I don't know if any of you have um, state fairs where you are. I'm sure some of you do. If you're in the Midwest or if you're in the West, you have state fairs. I don't remember state fairs growing up on the East Coast, but I'm sure that they had them. We probably just didn't live in a capital city to be around them growing up. So, um, But of course, if you've read um, Charlotte's Web, you know what a state fair is like, right? So that's one of the reasons why I love to go back to the state fair every year, because it reminds me of those childhood books. Um, Charlotte's Web, and then um, another one that my mom would read to us once um, was um, Windy Foot and the State Fair. It's about a horse, and she read it to us because our great uncle illustrated the Windy Foot series, and, but they're very hard to get because they're out of print, so we actually didn't own a copy, but we, I think we got it from the library. But anyways, um, if you've never been to a state fair, read those books, because it will give you an idea of what a state fair is like. But we went to the state fair this year. I had missed it last year because at the time I was um, eight months pregnant and on bed rest. <laughs> so uh, there was no fair walking for me. Um, and then the year before, I think we were just too busy and um, tired, so we didn't go. So. Um, it has been two years since I was at the state fair, and there's nothing like a state fair for people watching, for um, color, for excitement, for creativity. I mean, the creativity in the craft and the home economics um, buildings are just fabulous. Um, the things for kids to explore and how things grow and how people make things. It's just, it's just wonderful. They had a wonderful section for, uh, for little boys this year. You could climb on tractors. Um, they had a combine that you could climb in and you could drive. Now it was stationary, you couldn't go anywhere. And then they had another tractor that you could climb in and drive. And then they had a video right in front of the windshield of um, the tractor moving through fields. So John got up there and he's driving the tractor and he really, I mean, he just got into it. Um, it was really hard to drag him away from that section. I, I let him play there for a very long time. And then they have little hands on the farm where you can go in and plant seed and then you harvest it um, and then you bring it to market and you sell it and you sell it for money and then you can go into a store and buy something with the money. And it's, it's, 
I think you earn like a dollar or for ten dollar and then you can either buy uh, apple juice um, a little carton of kids apple juice or you can buy popcorn or maybe a granola bar so John really loved that um, Arthur loved it I thought Arthur Arthur what at the time was ten months he's eleven months now but um, or he's he was ten and a half months he um, cause it was just three weeks ago anyways um, I thought he would fall asleep because it was during his morning nap time and usually if you're pushing him in the stroller he'll fall asleep and just take his nap whenever he wants to well no there was so much to see and so much to look at that he was he was right there hanging on to the front even though he was so tired and just watching everything you know we had an elephant there's an elephant ride at the state fair with real stinky elephants <laughs> um, so the kids really really enjoyed it um, and then the big thing for me at the state fair is the sheep barn and I love to go to the sheep barn and see all the different kinds of sheep and and I don't know just be around all their woolly goodness um, and and um, then in the sheep barn my ulterior motive is the wool room um, which is like going to a minuscule fiber fair because they have yarn and they have um, fleeces and they have um, prepared roving and prepared top from local farms and they sell it so I love to go there um, I every year I, I go I always stop in the wool room so after we had spent um, I think like three hours four hours uh, having lunch and in the kids section letting the kids play um, I knew it was time getting ready for us to go home the kids are tired um, but I'm like we have to go to the sheep barn and of course I'm like you gotta be little the sheepies kids oh well, mommy really needs to go to the wool room <laughs> we get to the sheep barn and, and keep in mind at the Indianapolis State Fair Indiana State Fair the all the kids stuff is on one side of the fair and then on the other side are all the animal barns. Now they have a few animals up in the kids section. Um, they have like miniature, a miniature cow and they have sheep. They did have a sheep, well a sheep and some lambs and they had some goats. Um, but the majority of the animals are across the fair. Um, that's where the horse barn is and the sheep barn and um, the pig barn. So it's quite, it, it's a little jaunt, and John was really tired, so I um, put him on the tram with Grandma to ride around um, so he didn't have to walk the whole way, and I trotted the buggy with Arthur in it around, um, and I actually got there first. <laughs> Go me! <laughs> um, and I waited for Grandma and, and, Arth and John to come off the trolley. We went into the sheep barn, and I'm looking around. And there weren't that many animals in there. And I look at them closely, and they're not sheep. <laughs> they're woolly and four legs, but they have horns. <laughs> and um, so we so we asked, where are the sheep? And um, they said, oh, the sheep were last week. <laughs> it's the goats. <laughs> so we missed the sheep by a week. And instead, we got to see the goats. Um, so, anyways, that was a little disappointment. But the, the wool room was still in operation. So I ran into the wool room, and we oohed and odd over some fleeces that were absolutely gorgeous. And um, but the kids were really, really tired and really beginning to complain. And you know, boys in a in a um, shop aren't too great. <laughs> At least my boys. <laughs> So uh, while well, Arthur was kind of squawking and John was trying to climb into the one seat stroller um, because he was too tired and wanted to ride and didn't want to walk anymore, he wanted to share the stroller with Arthur, but, which was an impossibility because there wasn't any room for him. I um, ran through the wool room and picked up some, um, some roving and paid for it and then we went out and we went straight to the car and went home. Um, so that was my 10 minute wool fest for the year. 
<laughs> I hadn't made it to any of the fiber festivals here in Indiana, Indiana this year. The spring was just too busy for us, and um, so that was my, my one window to go to a wool fest, and I made it 10 minutes. I got two things. Um, well, three things, actually, but two things. Um, I got some um, dyed locks. They were, uh, they were mixed locks. Uh, from a farm down um, by Greencastle, and the farm's name is Vintage Fibers. She does have a website online. It doesn't look like she sells through Etsy, um, but you could contact her through her website um, and see what she has available. But, um, and again, that's Vintage Fibers. But I got some um, dyed locks and took my foot carter and just combed the, um, the locks out just with a flip carter and then spun them. And they were so much fun to split spin. There were some long wools in here, there were some short um, staple fibers, and then there was even a little bit of angora from her bunny. So um, it made this lovely yarn. I then plied it with um, some Shetland that I had, some brown Shetland. So it made this lovely, lovely, lovely fiber, um, this lovely yarn. And I think, I'm, I, you know, I think this will become a hat. Wouldn't this make a gorgeous fall hat? So I'm really beginning to feel like knitting with orange. Is anybody else? It just feels like it's beginning to become orange season. <laughs> so gray and orange. Gray and orange go so well together. Um, and I can't get enough of it. It's just so pretty. So that was one. And then the next thing that I got was some beautiful Shetland from Grayside. Now Grayside is a, is a Shetland farm here in Indiana, and you can usually find them at the fiber festivals. Unfortunately, they're not online. Um, but I know that she does list her, she does have a listing online, and you might be able to contact her. She has her phone number on that listing. But her fiber, her Shetland fiber is absolutely fabulous. If you think Shetland is scratchy, you have to try her Shetland fiber. The way either the pasture that she has for her sheep to, to graze on or the way that she takes care of them or the type that she has, maybe all three combined, she has really, really soft, fluffy Shetland sheep. I mean, this is like spinning Angora. It's just gorgeous. But of course it sticks together, whereas Angora is a little harder to spin. But um, it's just, it's like spinning down. It's just beautiful. So I have, I bought four ounces. Um, they came in two ounce packs. And I bought four ounces of this. And I have one spun up already on the bobbins. And then I'm just finishing this one off. And then we'll apply it. And hopefully it'll be ready to, for you guys to see next time. But if, just as a word of advice, if you are a little down on Shetland, you know, you need to try a different um, farm or a different supplier then because Shetland can be incredibly soft. Um, it's one of those really ex exquisite breeds of sheep that is just, it's just fabulous. So anyways, I was really happy to get my hands on some Grayside. I have tried to get some of her fiber at previous fiber fairs, but she does tend to sell out at fiber fairs, at least in my experience, and I haven't been able to get, um, now if you wanted an uh, unscoured or unprepared fleece, um, she did have one of those available when I saw her, but I am not up for that big of a job. I've done that before, <laughs> and with two little kids right now, I'm not up for that big of a job, um, so I was looking for something that's already prepared to spin. Um, but anyway, it's, it's really nice. So I was so happy. Two things, so happy. That was my fiber event for the year. I have been inspired, though, by some more fibery things, um, some more woolly, fleecy things. I, um, my mom's cousin has a farm up in Maine. Hi, Nina. And she raises, um, Scottish black face sheep, and they are mainly meat sheep, um, 
but they are very, very historic sheep in the sense that they have been around for a long time. They were originally used by the Vikings um, to put on islands along their shipping routes or their travel routes. And they didn't really ship, they really traveled. <laughs> um, and they would, just in case they shipwrecked or needed repairs to something, they would have these islands marked out on their maps where they had placed these um, sheep, these long wool sheep. Um, that the Scottish blackface are descended from because their, their fiber staple is so long and so coarse that their, their fiber can actually be used as sewing thread. And they would use those fibers to repair, make any repairs to their sails um, and also make repairs to clothing. And of course they could also use the clothing, um, use the wool for clothing and they could use the sheep for meat. And these are sheep that require very little, well, very, I was going to say very little care to a certain extent. They can be left on a island and um, even in cold climates and somewhat take care of themselves um, in a group. They do require some care though, <laughs> especially if you want them to thrive and um, be profitable as a meat source. So um, Nina, you do t do a lot. <laughs> it's not as if you don't do anything to take care of those sheep. but. Um, Nina sent me a big box of, of a fleece a while ago, maybe two years ago, and um, at the time I cleaned part of it and then I used those long staples, and I should have brought it up with me, I used those long staple fleece to, act, to tie a rug. Um, I cleaned each lock and laid it out in the sun to dry, and then I got the um, wide weft um, rug hooking um, canvas and it's the really wide slats and then I took a crochet hook and I just went through those slats pulled the yarn pulled the fiber through it and then tied a knot and I did that in lines to create the, the very thick um, lamb's wool rug I use it as a seat on our, our stone fireplace because our stone fireplace is a bit of a ledge um, but, and it has, I mean, it's so durable. Oh my goodness, it's so cushiony. That sheep was uh, was oftentimes used um, in the carpet trade. Their, their wool was often used in the carpet trade. So um, that's what made me think of using it as a hand-tied um, mat. But then I thought, oh, I still have this box. It's two years later. I still have this box of, of fiber. What am I going to do with it? I don't want it to go to waste. So I decided to spin part of it up, a little bit of it up, <laughs> there's a lot of it, um, into some yarn. And this is half and half. This is half um, Scottish blackface and half German um, merino or um, the equivalent merino. My sister-in-law brought back a huge bump from Germany for me and of very soft downy um, wool and I've been spinning it since February and I think I just finished it off so I, I've used it in various different projects and various different skeins um, but I because the Scottish blackface is very scratchy I wanted to ply it with a softer um, yarn so that it, you could actually wear it now I wouldn't say that you could wear this next to your skin I don't you know, if you can see, it's very, very hairy. Those are the long, long bits. It's a dual coated sheep, so there's the very long ha um, fibers, and then there's the very short downy fibers. And those the very long fibers are kind of scratchy. I mean, <laughs> they could be used like sewing thread. <laughs> but I want to make Nina a hat. Sorry, Nina, if you're watching, it spoils the surprise. But I thought it would be so cool for her to have a hat made out of her very own sheep that she takes care of. So I have chosen this cute, adorable hat, Molly's hat, and I here's my the skein of yarn that I spun up and plied. So that is what's going on my needles next. As soon as I um, there's a few other projects that need to come off, but that's going on my needles next. Then I thought, okay, what can I do with the rest of this wool? because I still had <laughs> a big, a large amount. This is a big fleece. Um, and I was, I've been watching 
um, Amy Bass podcast, The Fat Squirrel Speaks, and she mentioned um, these wonderful farm series done by um, the, the, um, over in England by some historians where they take um, different farms and they work them um, as historic farms. So the one that I was watching, it's called Tales from a Green Valley, and it's a farm near the Welsh border that was um, built in around 1620. They um, found the foundations and the, the parts of it, and they restored it to an actual working farm, and then they had some historians come and stay there and work it over the length of a year. And at the time, in 1620, the wool trade was still um, one of England's largest um, sources of revenue and sources of wealth. The, um, the wool that was used for clothing and for rugs and for various other upholstery goods um, was a huge source of, of wealth for, the, for Britain. Um, so sheep were kept in vast numbers. Well, because the, f the um, fleeces were so, f for so highly prized and so valuable, every part of the fleece was used even if it was those yucky, dungy parts of the fleece that we usually take off and throw away um, when we um, skirt a fleece after it's been sh after a sheep has been fle sheared, they go through and they just get out all those yucky bits that are covered with mud and brambles and things like that, and they throw them away. But th what they were, the historians were saying on the show, is that no, even back then, those were taken out. Yes but they were saved and they were washed and they were cleaned and then they were used to stuff pillows. And um, even poor people would come around and beg for just a little handful of wool and then after a great number of years they would have enough to stuff a pillow and they would have their very own wool pillow. And I was fascinated by this concept because so many fleeces go to waste. Um, even meat sheep have to be sheared. It's part of taking good care of the sheep is to shear a sheep. So there is a vast number of, of fleeces, I can't even imagine, that go to waste because meat sheep do not often have the quality of, of um, fleece to spin or to use um, as wool. And also, let's face it, we don't wear wool clothing like we did in the 1620s. And we don't even use wool upholstery like we used to. Um, though it would be nicer if we did. <laughs> but anyways, um, so there, anybody, well, you can usually get your hands on a fleece that nobody wants. Um, especially if you know a sheep farmer that's a meat farmer um, that farms those sheep for meat. You can usually find they'll give their fleeces away. Um, and I, the concept of using fleece for a pillow is fascinating to me because uh, sheep, lamb, lamb's wool, is an automatic um, deterrent to um, dust mites. If you're really allergic to dust mites, they say to get a, um, a lamb's wool um, mattress and a lamb's wool pillow. Now you can buy them online and they're really, really expensive. Um, and they're, you know, fine gray. They've taken all the allergens out of the lamb's wool because you can be allergic to stuff that's in lamb's wool. But um, those are the best sources if you're highly allergic to dust mites, which I am, um, to, to use as your bedding because the lamb's wool um, wicks away the moisture and that's one of the things that dust mites need to thrive is moisture. Well, I'm not going to use this as my bed pillow. <laughs> but I thought, wouldn't it be fun to wash up all that, the rest of the fleece, and to use it as stuffing for a pillow for the boys to use on the wooden floors. We have wooden floors in the playroom, and um, it would be great to have some big pillows to um, throw on the floor that they can sit on while they play, or they can throw around. Um, just it's fun to have big stuffy pillows to sit on, so so that's my plan. This is only half of it. <laughs> but I have been washing 
and then um, drying this the rest of the fleece. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see how it goes. My plan is to make big pillowcases out of um, drop cloth material that you can get because it's really highly durable and I can just let the boys go to town with it and then to stuff those pillows for floor pillows for the boys. So I'll let you know how I get on with that. But that is another project that I am was really, really fascinated with. Um, after watching the, that episode. Again, that episode, you can watch that particular one. It's it's on YouTube, and it's called Tales from a Green Valley, and it's episode 10. So just in case you want to go and get inspired like I was. So, well, after all of that, what is, uh, let's start with what's out of my knitting bags lately. The one thing that's just out of my knitting bags or project bag is this adorable little crown that I made for John. He's turning five tomorrow. And I've in the past years I've made him a hat of some kind. I have I made him a three year old hat that's very similar to this, but smaller. And then I made him one when he was turned one. Um, when he turned two I used a cowboy hat. And when he was four, I think we did a paper crown. So um, we haven't always done a crown, a felted crown like this. But this time I was smart. <laughs> I made this one that's slightly adjustable in the back. And then I lightly sewed the five down. If you could see, whoops, get used to this camera. And I can unpick that number five and put on a number six. So my plan is that we can use this next year too. What I might do is every year add a little bit more up embroidery to it to make it a little different and a little fun. But um, that is the that is something that's out of my project bag today, and hopefully, and it will be used tomorrow for his birthday. Um, another thing that's out of my project bag that I finished is the um, zigzag baby blanket that I was doing for a friend. It is pram size, so it's it's smaller than a baby blanket should be or would be, but um, I know that she has um, a baby blanket already that she made. Uh, I just wanted to make something myself and give it to her because um, I was so thrilled um, with this little baby. And it's always nice to have a smaller one that you can use in the stroller that doesn't drag on the ground. So um, I always make one for I've made one for both John and for Arthur, and um, they're just great, great little handy blankets. So if you normally make a large sized um, baby blanket um, for friends, um, don't don't ever be dissuaded from doing a smaller one um, because it's really nice to have options as a mom, and it's really nice to have a blanket to snug the baby up in the stroller in the winter and the autumn so and in the spring too so that was one I used Knit Picks um, Bravo Worsted which is an acrylic yarn I um, the mother that this is going to um, is not a knitter and so I thought it would probably be best if it wasn't, if it was very, very easy care. So this is very easy care. Throw in the washer, throw in the dryer, and that's great. So if you ever need um, a really easy care yarn for a gift, the Knit Picks Brava is wonderful. It's very, very soft, and it wears really, really well. So I highly recommend it. And they have great colors, too, which I always like. The other thing that's off my needle, I talked about this last time. This is the I Will Remember, well, it's I'll Remember April, and it's beautiful, isn't it? I don't know if you can see the detail, the lace. Do you remember how I started this? I started the first row of the lace four different times. <laughs> it's just because each time I was starting it, I was um, starting it when I was either tired and watching a show or... I'm distracted by the boys. So once I got the first row down, it was it was a breeze. 
um, it was an easy lace that you could memorize, but it was it wasn't hard. So um, I'd highly recommend that pattern. See, I remember I'll remember April, um, and I loved the bind off on it. It's more of like a, a braided bind off. Let's see if you can see that. The yarn is Madeline Tosh light, and the color hmm was a while ago, and I took the band off. I don't know. But it's a beautiful wine color. So, that was fun. That was a lot of fun. It's always fun to have a lace shawl on your needle. Um, the other thing that I was going to show you was um, this is the other thing that's in I guess is that all the stuff that's out that I finished? I think it is. I think there is. There's an, there's another one that I'm almost done with, but not quite. I have made little progress on my um mitered square blanket. This is entirely made out of home sp hand spun. I wanted to do a blanket where I could remember um, all the fun little hand spun things that I have done. So um, that is what I've started. And it's really a lot of fun to add to it one by one. It's fun knitting. You know, you always need that easy, easy, easy fun knitting. So that's in the project bags right now. Another one that's in the project bags right now is an idea for a pattern. And um, some people do um, designing differently, and I do it differently at different times. Sometimes I just need to cast things on my needles and just try it out. Other times I need to sit down and draw it out and do the math and then cast it on. But um, oftentimes I need to sketch in the yarn itself. So this is kind of what I've been was doing here. I wanted a little neckerchief that I could use just one skein with, a f oh, sorry, a 50 gram skein, so a half a skein. Um, sometimes there's those beautiful hand-painted yarns that you just want to get um, one skein and do a little something with. So um, this, is a, this is a really easy neckerchief or bandana style um, bandana that I'm knitting, and it's almost done. It's almost done. It has one more row and the bind off to do. And then we'll see how I like it. But this is, I used a skein of Koigu that I had, somebody, someone had given to me. And um, it's just, it's very pretty. It has pink and blues and greens in it. And it's just, it's just a very pretty yarn. And it's fun to have a little pattern that you can use, those hand-painted, um, highly variegated skeins of yarn for. So, anyways, that's an idea that's brewing. My socks. Okay, I finished a pair of socks, and I put them away, and I didn't show you guys, did I? All right, next time. I shouldn't put them away. <laughs> I am now, because I finished the other pair, working on my lightning bolt socks. Guys, check out the lightning bolts. <laughs> This is yarn that I dyed with a friend on her birthday, and um, I don't know how it came out with all those lightning bolts, but it did. So it is vivid, very, very, very vivid, uh, orange and yellow and blue. So I have one done, and I have the next one on the needle. This is my double point sock needle holder from Knitting Notions, and I love it. It's very easy. You unwind one side, and you only have to unwind one side, and then, do you see those grooves? Your needles fit into those grooves, and it just keeps everything all together without getting bent or broken or lost, and I love mine. So, Knitting Notions, I think you can find them online. I found them at a fiber festival, but they're often and they're often at a lot of fiber festivals, 
but I think they are online as well. So the other thing that I have in the front pocket <laughs> of my project bag, which have you noticed my project bags are really makeup bags? <laughs> the only real project bag that I own is the one that my sister, um, the Felted Flower Shop on Etsy, makes out of tea towels. And this is um, the tea towel from my year that I was born. So, um, but anyways, yeah. A friend gave me a bunch of unused makeup bags from Clinique that her mom had collected and I thought, yes, this is great for project bags because they're just the right size and they, anyways, so definitely, um, well, I was going to say, I, I'm a type of person that thinks creatively about the uses of things. <laughs> so, if you want, um, anyways, someday I will own a project bag from one of those famous project bag makers that you see online. But, for right now, I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine with my very humble project bag. Um, in the front of this, I have cutouts made out of brown paper bags of the people of people's feet who I make socks for. <laughs> that sounds funny. <laughs> I have cutouts of people's feet. <laughs> but I like to make socks for John. So here is John's foot. And what I've done, um, I got the idea from the fish lips kiss heel pattern. And if you haven't seen that pattern, it's it's great. It's a dollar on et on Ravelry, and it gives you so much information about how to measure your foot and how to knit socks that are custom for your feet. Which, if you have never had a sock that is custom to your foot, you are missing out. So get that pattern, and then make these little cutouts. <laughs> um, and what I did is. Uh, as she has you in the pattern, um, mark where your ankle bone is, and then mark where your big toe starts, the bone of your big toe. So, and then the measure in between, and that's the length of your sock that you need to knit it from the, the bottom of the heel to where you start your decreases for your toe. And I thought it was ingenious, because I love to knit socks for my mom every Christmas. I knit her a couple of pairs, but I... I'm always trying to dig in my notebooks. Oh, where did I put her numbers? You know? Well, now I have them. I have my mom's foot. They have her measurements. So I don't have to guess anymore. And I thought I would knit some for my husband. Um, I've never knit him socks, so I took his. And then mine. And this is so funny, guys. My foot is the biggest foot. <laughs> Voila! I wear a size eight and a half to nine US shoe and um, I, I have the biggest foot of the family. <laughs> Whee! Oh well, that's okay. So all my papers I keep in the front of my sock bag in this little in the little pouch. So I am thrilled. I do have to start knitting for Christmas socks for my mom. That is a must. So no more socks for me, I have to start knitting for my mom. What else in this project bag, in the own one and only real project bag that I own? <laughs> By the way, I love that it says, have a good day. Doesn't that just make you smile? I mean, how cool is that? Have a good day. Um, is a, hopefully, new design. Hopefully I won't tear it out. I am knitting with a 100% baby alpaca. And I wanted it to be a fingering weight yarn, but I couldn't find a hundred percent baby alpaca, not just alpaca, but baby alpaca. Baby alpaca is softer and has better drape in a fingering weight. If you guys know of of one that you would recommend, let me know. But I um picked out um I found knit picks has it in lace weight, so I am taking the lace weight and doubling it 
which um, is creating a really lovely fabric. So I will show that to you more when it's a little farther along and closer to being released. But it's really, really nice. It's really lovely. So I'm excited about it. Is there anything else that is on my needles? No. Oh, yes. I wanted to show you this. I talked about this last time, actually two and two times ago, I think. Remember in South Haven, there was that yarn in that yarn shop, that yarn in that yarn shop, um, by Shepherd's Yarn, that um, where they had taken all their ends of um, yarn runs and they had saved them and then they had done a big yarn run where they plied the leftover bits with a gray yarn to create this self-striping amazing balls of color goodness um, and I thought oh I could do that with my stuff that I spin because there's always a little bit left on the bobbins um, and I could save it and and make yarn out of it so here is my <laughs> paper towel too, where I've been winding off the stuff on my bobbins. There are a few colors that you can see on there, and then this green needs to be wound on there next. But it is so much fun. I can't wait to try it out. I don't know how much more I need to get before I make a skein, but I'm thinking um, a little bit more. So I keep going with that one. It's fun. I have made some Rolag. Ooh, my goodness. I am really obsessed with Rolag making right now. It's kind of bad. I have two sets of Rolags that I've been making. Two different kinds of colors. I really have been into orange. It's just that season. So I dyed some fiber. And then I um, made Rolag. Aren't they just so much fun. You guys, if you haven't tried making roll legs, they're so easy. You don't, you don't even need anything. The only thing that you need is prepared top and a large knitting needle for rolling it. Or a stick. Or a dowel. That's all you need. That's it. So if you have never made them, you, what are you waiting for? It's just totally awesome. So. Those are my will I I'm going to spin those next, hopefully. And then I got two things from two wonderful, generous people. The first is a postcard from Juniper Grace. Grace is so sweet. If you haven't read, uh, listened or watched her blog, watched her podcast, you have to go to Juniper Grace blog and watch her podcast. She also is on YouTube. It's absolutely fabulous. So here, she, here is her postcard and she says, Christina, greetings to my hometown. This is a picture of the school that people go to to become musicians. I always wanted to study there, but alas, university was calling my name. I, are, I hope you are having a truly wonderful summer. Thank you for being a Juniper. Hugs and kisses, Juniper Grace. Isn't that fun? So um, John really liked getting a postcard from Canada. His um, aunt sometimes sends him postcards from Germany, and um, he, anyways, it was fun. It was a good learning experience of going to the map and showing him where Canada is, and um, so we will be post putting that up on the wall. And if any of you want to send postcards, feel free to PM me on Ravelry, and um, I'll give you my address and you can send a postcard and I'm sure John will be thrilled. So, I was thrilled. And then I got this from a wonderful friend, a very sweet, dear friend. Um, I got this adorable poster. Isn't that cute? It says family album. <laughs> I think this should be hung up rather than used as a coaster. It's just too cute. And then this Fair Isle Boot Toppers from Mountain Colors. And it's a kit. Look at those colors. Aren't they beautiful? For making um, boot toppers. 
So I am so excited. I've never gotten a kit before. Um, and I'm really, really, really thrilled to try it out. Mountain Colors is just a beautiful yarn. So um, she also bought the same kit for herself. And then our, our other friend, Gina. Hi, Gina. She has um, already made hers. So um, we will be making them together. And then hopefully on some fun knitterly outing, we will all wear them together. So anyway. That was some fun that arrived in the mail today. Or actually, it was delivered, hand delivered to me this week. So, thank you very much. That was very, very kind. So, anyways, well, I should sign off because um, time is of the essence, right? And I have a birthday to prepare tomorrow and some cakes to make and a house to decorate. So, I better let you go. Um, in the meantime, until the next podcast, you can find me on R the Ravelry group. It's A Knitter's Life on Ravelry. You can find me on Ravelry as Christina Wall. I did want to say thank you to all of those um, who had purchased patterns over the summer. A big, big, big hearty thank you. Um, the, pa the money from those patterns went to buy John his school uniform. So he is all set for um, the school uh, term and with his cute little uniform. And I will put a picture of him in his uniform on the blog so you can see that. And that's a knitterslife.blogspot.com. Um, but you can find my patterns on Ravelry under, if you look under designers, and if you just type in Christina Wall, and it's Christina with a C H and Wall, W A L L. Um, so you can find all my patterns there. So, and then you can find me daily on Instagram as a knitter's life. So I hope you come and, and visit me in those locations. And until next time, happy knitting.